All right, I'm here today with Trevor Perry. Trevor is a, I guess, a tax lawyer is how you bill yourself, Trevor. I'm hoping you can tell us From a little time bit to about, time, yes. <laughs> about yourself and your practice. Sure. Uh, I'm the self-described tax mercenary. So yes, uh, called to the bar in Ontario in 1996, did the Osgood uh, Master of Tax Law in 2013, and basically work in concert with the advisory team to uh, tie in all the professionals, uh, you know, obtain the opinions as necessary, uh, get the planner on board, uh, and, and uh, tie everything up with a nice bow. So um, in my bent, of course, is to uh, prudently reduce tax as much as possible, because uh, I believe in this tax environment, we are doing holy work by doing that. So. And you would sort of act as the, for the advisor, you would say like, this will work or this won't work. You bring the oh, yeah, actuary yeah. in. I, yeah, very much. You know, I, I, it's almost like a third party opinion. You know, the background, particularly as we're going to talk about individual pension plans, having done so many of them, um, I'm able to, to talk to the planning issues, the tax issues. Uh, if there's a client fit, what are the alternatives? Um, because it it works in a lot of scenarios, but sometimes uh, people think, you know, either some folks just think it's greater than sliced bread. A lot of the time I find, because I tend to have a tax focus, that sometimes certain things work better. So, And what about the, the client's advisory team? Do you act as go-between with their accountant and lawyer, for example? Yeah, yeah as much as I'm a lawyer, I speak accountant. Most of my day is uh taught or is dealing with with accountants uh some of them and, and there's varying uh, levels of comfort with the structure and with tax in general so uh trying to i don't want to say simplify it because tax is never going to be simple but to make it understandable that's fair now i know you uh you have a whole bunch of areas of that uh, sort of let's call it tax consulting you're involved in can you give us a quick elevator pitch on the ipp and Maybe the RCA too. I don't want to get into the RCA too much sure. here, but I find yeah, so. I mean, uh, yeah, I'm in, uh, involved in a variety of tax-focused areas, reorganizations. I do a lot of large cases, uh, life insurance cases, triage on existing cases where we have to fix them. A lot of uh, finance stuff. But my previous incarnation was national sales director for a boutique actuarial firm. So in that time, we did about 2200 IPPs, which I think is still more than anybody in the country, and about 500 RCAs. And though I haven't been there uh, in a number of years, I'm still consulting on it all the time. And I use a number of, you know, very reputable actuarial firms, including the one that I was with. Uh, we're all friends and uh, two and two based in Alberta, one based in BC. Uh, and, you know, occasionally uh, Quebec. Um, but that's given me the familiarity and having come away from it and that I'm not quote unquote selling IPPs anymore, I can be, um, uh, you know, removed from it and, and provide sort of a, a clinical or a surgical uh, opinion on if they work or not. Um, RCAs, you know, I still see them uh, a lot uh, for a variety of, for a variety of reasons, not just executive compensation, but there's certain accounting uses um, that we've that we've seen a lot of international issues, professional athletes. I still do that. My basement is full of signed Montreal Canadiens jerseys because I am a fanatic and give them a discount. I would charge the Leafs double. But uh. <laughs> I I do remember reading your article in the Globe about the uh, how the the locker rooms are full of uh, RCAs, and I was oh, thought yeah. it made a lot of sense. Yeah, in in uh, in Canada. Uh, they're widely used, I mean, by, by the NHL. In fact, the NHL has its own documents. Um, the, I have not been able to crack the Blue Jays, but I understand that they, they're, they widely use it. The one that I've been to the altar three or four times on is the Raptors. Yeah. And the NBA won't play ball. They think it creates a, an unfair advantage to the Toronto team, which given the fact that in Ontario, you're paying 53.5% on every dollar north of 220 is a bit of a preposterous idea, but you know, I can write memos till I'm, you know, falling asleep, but they, they just don't want to do it right now. It's an interesting thing. I imagine there's even a little bit of uh, like sales pitch to the idea. Like this is so good. The Raptors won't, or the NBA won't allow it. Right. Yeah. And when we, we pitched it the first time we said, listen, why don't you do this? Like the NHL has a limit as to how much the guy can put in and it's half the non escrowed amount. You could do the same thing in the NBA because they, it's a similar payroll system, or you'd say, listen, take the other teams take the median team, what maybe let's like Indiana or something like that for tax rates and say, okay, you can't be in a better situation than them. 
you can build it in the documents. And it, it's the issue is, you know, with RCAs, you get a foreign complexity because it's not what we call a Section 409A compliance. So the Americans don't recognize it as a, a qualified deferred compensation. So there are all kinds of deleterious tax effects if you don't do it right. And I've done a number for, for US citizens playing here. And there's some excellent accountants who know how to do this. I mean, we were talking about Kim Moody. Kim can do this. Kevin Nightingale at MNP is a wizard. He, he th These guys do it. Uh, there's some guys in Montreal I've worked with. So whenever you get into you know, a cross-border complexity, I mean, we're, we're taught to avoid uh, risk. Retain. Yes, it makes the bill go up, but you don't want things blowing up in your face and you can when you get u.s citizens pensions so, are fine by the way ipps are they're covered in the treaty right right just a little bit of extra paperwork right but the actual taxation yeah. is not uh, no double tax on IPPs there's no double or anything tax, like no. that yeah no, they're recognized that's fine yeah i think it's chapter sense. 18 of the track of the uh, treaty but i haven't looked in a while so i guarantee i don't know so um so yeah, let's delve into the IPP a little bit more then. Can you talk about, maybe just to get us started, the the funding set up for the IPP? Sure. So you've got somebody who has none and is going to start one? Okay, so the easiest way, I mean, when, I, when I'm being Ontario-centric, and excuse me for being so, because as you know, my my uh, ideological heart is in Calgary. Um, the, uh, th this is the teacher's pension plan for a business owner. Or, or an incorporated professional. Overwhelmingly, they are funded on a defined benefit basis. There are hybrid plans which incorporate defined contribution. There's not a lot of them and they're overly complex. And in my humble opinion, uh, they are marketed as a solution or as a, uh, as a solution for a problem that doesn't exist. Um, you fund on the basis of length of service and age. And the older that you are, guess what? It takes more money to buy the benefit. So the contributions go up each year. Uh, there are three primary funding components that are involved in the structure. The structure itself is a trust. Uh, it is uh, registered with the, with the relevant uh, section of CRA. Very nice people uh, have worked with them for years and, uh, and they get these things done and, and, and in a timely fashion. Uh, but you basically are going to have what's called past service contribution, a current service contribution, and an RRSP rollover. And to explain how that works, your current serv service contribution is what's your annual contribution? And it's going to be based if you have the same income at which the RSP maximizes, if you're over the age of about 40, the IPP contribution will be larger and, and, and continually will grow. Uh, the past service amount is the technical uh, uh, description is it's the accumulation of all past service pension adjustments over the years. The, it's, that's gobbledygook. What it is, is it's basically the difference between what you could have put in to one of these things over and above the money purchase or RSP limit for those period of years. And the longer that that period is, the bigger the number. So routinely, so Leah Koiv and I wrote a paper for STEP a few years ago and it gets updated regularly and it is quite a, a, a barn burner of a read. And it goes through the numbers uh, on the basis of indexing and all that kind of stuff. But you know, for a, for a 63 year old entrepreneur, who's let's say you know spouses are both working for the company and they're looking at a possible exit your past service numbers can be routinely more than a million bucks which is a deduction of the company so that's why accountants go wow we like this uh, so so that those are the big two where deductions are created current and past service but you have to roll over a piece of the rrsp and, and the logic there is that you can't have you can't be active in both systems rsp system pension system so they'll come up with a number uh, and that has to roll over its plan to plan transfer. There's no, there's no tax considerations. Now there were changes. Um, so they have to go through a double calculation method. And in the very rare case where you have a really large RRSP, it can reduce the past service amount. But I think you, you know, talking to the actuaries, I think you're looking at plans where the RSP is in excess of a million bucks. Uh, but they'll ask that they'll do the calculation and they explain that. But in uh, act, we leave that to the actuaries to do. How much of uh, then changes? I mean, maybe you aren't uh, up on this, but the uh, Canadian Institute of Actuaries revised some of their calculations for pensions a couple of years ago. Has that any had any impact? No, not to, not doesn't affect IPPs because they're all IPP is also referred to as a designated plan, and the designated plan came in in '91, 
And it was the means by which an entrepreneur or a business owner, or, or if they had incorporated professionals, then could actually be part of a plan. And so there's three uh, key metrics that are that are considered. One is that you're assuming a wage increase of five and a half percent a year, a four percent inflation increase or rate, and a seven and a half percent rate of return. So um, when you're dealing with a designated plan, those are fixed. Uh, so, so changes to other pension plans uh, it is not germane. This thing is is there. There have been very important changes on the provincial level in some of the provinces in the last year with regards to individual pension plans, but not with to, with regards to the valuation metrics. If I'm not mistaken, you're talking about like in Ontario, for example, they sort of yeah. removed the adverse consequences of underfunding the pension plan. Yeah, exactly. We finally got religion like Alberta and DC and Quebec have had for years. So, I mean, and I had discussions with the, with the pension authorities, as did, I believe, KLU and, and other groups. But we basically said, look, you're, you're trying to enforce pension logic, sort of a paternalistic approach to pensions for plans that are made by shareholders for themselves. So if you were working at the local, you know, Ford plant and you have a, a, a pension plan, Yes, they should have an overarching government program to make sure that that thing's funded and your benefit is paid out. It made no logical sense that a dentist who's responsible for his or her own, you know, financial uh, success should be fettered with these these pension rules. So what happened was the Ontario Pension Benefits Act was amended in January, and I'll say beforehand there was always the ability to, to deal with underfunding, and uh, it, was, it was always a, there was always a safety valve in there. But what they did is they said, look, you can elect to to drop yourself out of the pen, uh, out of the governance of the over the provincial legislation, and what that means is that when the actuary comes along and does the valuation every three years, and let's say they say, well, Jason, your plan's sixty thousand bucks in deficiency, you were in Alberta, so this this was always the rule, but I mean in Ontario now they don't have to fund it. If you don't want to, you don't have to. So that that made this thing just easy to use. And Quebec had had that for years and BC for years. Manitoba has it. And then other provinces have followed suit. The only one I think large province that hasn't is Saskatchewan. And hopefully they'll they'll do that. They have some different rules. Um, and again, I would consult actuarial specialists on that. But I know New Brunswick and I think Newfoundland have followed the Ontario model and I believe Nova Scotia. So uh, most of the country is now not enforcing funding. So if you're in Saskatchewan, you have an underfunded IPP, it just means you're doing a little more work with the actuary. Yeah, yeah, they have to. I mean, I, I haven't read the, pen, the, the Pension Benefits Act, but I'm going to assume it's got a similar safety valve to what we had in Ontario, which is basically you would rewrite the the, uh, the benefit uh, uh, promise and and make it go away. But again, I would you know talk to uh, to actuaries in the region or who have special uh, specialization there. Makes sense. Thanks. Now, what about reporting obligations for the IPP? I guess speaking of working with the actuary. Yeah, and they do it all. Uh, that was always funny because the accountants always thought they had to do the reporting, and no, they don't. Um, it's actually very easy to use, and I still do a ton of talks to accountants across the country, and we talk about all kinds of wonderful things. But this comes up, and I say, look, your actual involvement in is it other th other than blessing it, making sure it's right for your client is extremely minimal. Uh, so. There is a T. Uh, there's a T three RC or T three pension plan, uh, return done every year. So because it's a trust, it has to report by March thirty first, and the actuaries are all set up to do that. It's pretty straightforward. It asks, you know, what was the right? You know, didn't even. It, 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 there's not even a valuation report in that. It's it's just looking at where the contributions made, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but they do that for you. And does it still have to get reported to the pension supervisor? Or does the pension supervisory authority just not if care they've opted about out now? No. So okay, yeah. And what, do you have a rough idea what that's going to cost? Like what the annual maintenance cost is for most of the actuaries do. Uh, most of them have a setup fee and then an annual. So I think routinely you're looking at sort of like a twenty five hundred dollars setup fee and probably like sort of thousand to fifteen hundred bucks a year to run it. Um, I know when I was when we were a GBL, we went level. Uh, but I haven't looked at anyone's pricing for, for a long time. But that ballpark anyways is helpful. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And, and they're trustee uh, plans. So either the actuary is acting as a trustee, you've got three people on it. Um, the cost and complexity of a corporate trustee here is just unnecessary. I mean, a couple have tried and stepped out um, and, and very rarely do you see it. And if it's, uh, if it's, if it's an insurance plan, if it's segregated funds, there's no, there's no trust required. 
of course, because there's already a trust there, I guess, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And there are some some good uh, sort of high net worth seg fund platforms out there now. So. Sure. You're just looking at cost. Again, it's it's what's the advisor and, and client relationship? What are they comfortable doing? I see, you know, a lot of private money managers doing them. Uh, but it doesn't require the client to fundamentally change their investment philosophy. You're targeting, you know, sort of a blended return, seven and a half. And in these markets, they tend to get them. Have you seen where you would sort of deliberately just use that for your fixed income portion? And yeah, if the accountant's driving the bus and the company, let's say they're paying significant grip rate tax and they want a bigger deduction, you'll, you'll see that. I've seen it when I was doing these things, occasionally the accountant would say, you're going into money market. You know, you get a 1% return and they're just writing a check every year. I don't think that it, that's, that's the tax, you know, tax tail driving the dog. It's uh, wagging the dog. I don't agree with that, but to each his own. Yeah. And I guess it depends. There's a whole asset allocation question that has to go into that, but yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't like the idea of a million bucks sitting in money. No, I tend to, like when I'm doing yeah. like what we'll call insured retirement plans, I tend to present the insurance as the, as the fixed income portion in a corporate scenario. Uh, but the, the pension should be run like a pension. Yeah. That makes sense. Go get your return, right? Yeah. So. Now, who do you think this works well for? Who would be, let's say, your kind of sweet spot IPP client? And then I know there's a whole bunch of edge cases. Sure. I mean, when I was selling them, everyone was was great for an IPP. Uh, now, I really sort of say there's two. There's two scenarios, maybe a third. And the th let's go with the third. The third might be, because Leah Coiv can speak to this, and she's far bigger brain than I am. Um, we've looked at them for farmers, where you have lower income, but significant years of it. And it's part of a family farm succession strategy. So that works. So that's the, one of your subsets. Uh, and I've been a member of the Canadian Association of Farm Advisors for years and glad to, I won't wear my three piece suit out because they yell at me when I, when I do that. But uh, one, there's two scenarios. One is pure tax. The other is more planning. Um, pure tax is exit strategy. The 63-year-old entrepreneur and spouse who've labored long, they've got retained earnings, they've, they're, they're looking at either a third-party sale or even, you know, uh, intergenerational reorganization transfer down to the kids. You're going to create a ton of deduction, like probably in excess of a million dollars of deduction. So you could engineer a loss, go back, get some of your grip, or, you know, parcel out that deduction in accordance with how you want to fund the plan, because you don't have to fund past service all at once. So from a pure tax perspective, I like that scenario. It works very well. Yes, they give up their RSP, but the contributions are, are so much larger, in, and they're in that tax bracket, the maximum bracket where it makes sense. The other is professional corps, and the subset is doctors. Um, Dentists, I always joke, they're good for three divorces, so we, their RSPs are already gone. But um, the uh, the doc, the medical doctor, the incorporated m medical doctor, uh, you know, they're they're not trained in financial matters. And I, I have, I, ha I mean, they're wonderful people. I have lots of clients and friends who are doctors, but they tend to get out of school in their mid thirties with a ton of debt. And then the long suffering spouse wants a five thousand square foot home right away, so they're not exactly good at cash management. They're not exactly good at retiring. So where I like the IPP is it's a nice set of handcuffs. It's a warm blanket. It does result in something. So it's remedial. And, and, and so from a planning perspective, I think that that makes sense. And you can bring it to the client. And yes, there's cases to be said that you, you're better off with an RSP. But I think a lot of the time, when the, particularly when the, when the physician is in their 50s, both tax and planning really coalesce quite nicely. Where, where it doesn't make sense is young doctors, because I see them getting pitched like hybrid plans. You're a 35 year old doctor. It's ridiculous. You're better off in an RSP. And if you need deductions, if you're that successful at that age and you need a corporate deduction, that's where an RCA makes sense. And you do both because pen, IPPs wipe out your RSP room. RS, RCAs don't. There's no pension adjustment. So really for the physician, like that prof corp scenario, that's about just cranking up the amount of deduction, building up that giant. Yeah. And, and again, going to the physician, they can't sell. Uh, dentists sell. So you have to be aware of the QSBC rules and structuring and how to move the pension and all that kind of stuff. Um, but with a doc, with a medical doctor, that professional corporation is there. Uh, even with TOSI and the SBD grind rules, it's there primarily as a savings vehicle. No one's going to buy it. So utilizing a pension, 
can protect against the loose loss of the small business deduction because you are physically moving money out of the company. Uh, it protects, it can be, it's, too, it's, a, it's an avenue around TOSI because you've got pension splitting. Um, so I like it for, for a lot of those reasons. I think the sweet spot is, uh, is medical doctors, certainly north of 45, north of 50. It, it, the case can be quite compelling. And can you go back to the farm case for a minute here? I find the farm case uh, very fascinating because you can even do some estate planning wins. With oh, sure you can. Case, yeah. And right? this is the critical thing. Cause again, there are uh, purveyors of the hybrid plan that will run around and tell you, Hey, are your kids in the company? Well, you should put them in even on a notional salary and roll them in the pension plan because it works like this. Mom and dad have a pension plan, but when, when mom and dad die, it's income and there's a big tax bill. But if you have the kids in the plan, there's no disposition. It just rolls down. Now, my position on that marketing is that it's a nightmare to try to create notional employment. And arguably, if you read the Canada, Canada Trust case on what are the, what are the key elements of a, of a GAR attack, that strategy screams GAR. Now, in a farming situation or any kind of a situation where junior or juniors are legitimately involved in the business and they are part of the succession and this is going to be their life's work. So if there's four kids from the farm family and one's going to take over the farm and the other three went to art school, don't put the other three in the pension plan. You can equalize the pension with this or equalize the estate with this lovely thing called life insurance. But you wanted the continuity of the fam family farm to, to move to junior or juniors. Well, there are roll down provisions, as you know, in the family farm corporation provisions, but put junior in the plan, but you don't need to put junior in when they're 35 years of age, because the simple math is they're better off in an RSP. It takes, and the actuaries can tell you this, to add an, a plan member probably takes less than a week to do. It's one form. So even if, you know, you've got a, a scenario where, you know, the farmer has, he gets the nasty call. You have to sit down with the doctor and say, you're, you know, settle up your affairs. Okay. You can, you still have time. I've never had that happen, but family farm pensions work if they're really family farms, because what will happen is even though the farmer may not have taken robust um, earnings, the, the it's indexed earnings. So you can still get multi hundred thousand dollar deductions. And if they're well in, uh, you, you know, in, in, uh, in pace to put the family succession plan in place, the farm succession plan in place, and junior and junior's family are now fully active in the, the farm, then perhaps you put junior and spouse in. Uh, again, easily done. And yeah, you save a ton of tax. It's prudent. It's clean. It works. It's, uh, yeah, I agree, though, that you have to have real employment. Like, it doesn't yeah. work to have notional employment. Oh, no, and I've seen the marketing materials for uh, the hybrid uh, purveyors and they're creating, as I said, it's a solution looking for a problem. They're trying to sell this thing in a, a, on the basis of obscure subsets of cases. And it makes no sense. It's overly complex. It's snake oil, in my opinion. And uh, it, it, it doesn't really provide a benefit. If anything, it obfuscates things. And again, my, my concern is GAR. Uh, if you're creating a transaction that has a clear tax benefit and you're perverting a section of the act, which arguably would be you are perverting regulation 8515, I think it's at least, you know, an aspiring auditor will at least raise it. So why go down that route? Just set it up for real cases. Now, you didn't talk at all about somebody who owns like a full on, say, like my case, learning co or yep. manufacturing co, something like that. And I'm assuming you're not a big fan of IPPs in cases where it's not a prof corp. Would I have that right? Or is it? No, that... no, you could, if it's, uh, no, I, I would say that in our work, we did a lot of prof corps, but the vast majority, pro, I mean, not vast majority, but a, a, a good majority of the plans are straight entrepreneurial enterprises. And again, it equates to a number of planning issues. Um, is there a tax need? Is there a planning need on the retirement side? What's the exit look like? If your business is saleable, then you're looking at properly structuring, structuring and make sure you live by the QSBC rules and all that kind of stuff. What's your longevity? What's your exit look like? Yeah, an IPP can make sense. But again, they have a lot of moving parts. There's not, a, I think there's no more than 15,000 plans in existence in Canada. And I remember years ago, Peter Merrick and I sitting in a, in a restaurant thinking we could set up a couple of hundred thousand plans. And then we, you know, I wrote big chunks of his book on IPPs and things like that. 
and we pounded the country like we you know all over the place and though you know i'm very happy that at gbl we did more plans than anybody in the country um it wasn't like floodgates opening it's a niche product and i think that all of the ipp providers will agree that each case is if you want to say sold it's sold case by case trying mass marketing and has been attempted and it creates a lot of interest but not a lot of not a lot of plans if anything else you know the, the usefulness of that exercise is it does hopefully engage people in a planning discussion because there are alternatives to IPPs. Maybe it's RCA, maybe it's RRSP, maybe it's insurance, maybe it's a reorg, maybe it's a waste away freeze, lots of things that need to be on the table. Maybe it's just simply saving for retirement. Like it well, might that's be the, the key, right? Yeah. And, and as though our government doesn't want us to save, mm -hmm. I, I am a big proponent as a historian of historically high savings rates. It's good for, it's good for societies. Now, can you talk about in that entrepreneur co, what happens when the corp gets sold, right? The saleable company and corp is gone sure. now, you have the IPP. Yeah, you see it most of the time with dental corps or an entrepreneurial situation. So what will happen again, uh, contingent on the provincial rules is let's just take a dentist. So dentist is uh, you know 55. There's an active market in the sale of dental practices. They set up an IPP when they were 45. It's got million million and a half dollars in it they the purchaser of the dpc is not going to want a pension plan same if they bought your company and you have an they don't want that they're not going to carry the liability so what ends up happening is that we they will generate you will generally have a holding company now in the dental scenario dentists strictly speaking are not supposed to have hold codes they have sister codes so it's what we refer to as a midnight hold co, hold co strategy that we can talk about another time uh, i do them all the time so basically they have two corps um, what will happen is that you will pay a salary from sister co it doesn't have to be big three grand whatever it is uh, you you're going to pay that salary right away and then for the next couple of years you're going to then under what we call the participating employer rule create a second sponsor to the plan so now you have the two corporations sponsoring the pension plan you will then again subject to provincial rules because previous to the ontario changes the before you could transfer the plan or have the sponsor one sponsor fall off their commitment had to be had to be funded now i'm assuming with the new rules it doesn't have to be but but again i would seek actuarial uh, consideration on that or opinion. So there, what then happens is that you for a moment have two sponsors and then once the corporation is sold, you would it would fall off. You'd simply no longer fund it. It would cease to be a sponsor, but your pension is fully intact now sponsored by the new co and or by the, the, the sister co. Uh, so that's how you do it. Um, the alternative are sometimes people wind them up. I'm not a fan of winding them up because it kicks out a huge taxable number. Yeah because you cease to be a designated plan, right? So you're no longer using the metrics in that regulation. You're using what are the current interest rates and things like that. So surpluses are massive and, you know, you get calls all the time. Uh, it's great for people who want to buy flow through shares because people are sitting with five and $600,000 tax bills as a result of a pension, uh, pension windup. Right. And that's, that's owing to uh, regulation 8517, the maximum transfer yeah. value. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So, what happens then in a just let's say that dentist doesn't sell they and I know that but let's just work with me here first or even the going back to the doc right yeah the doc so the doesn't doc, sell yeah the doc gets to age seventy one they have this big fat IPP now by that age or probably three million or yep. thereabouts so now what do they do with that IPP when they get to age seventy one well they have three options one is the one I don't like which is turn it off which is kicks out a big tax bill. Other option is a copycat annuity, which is when you're going to want to talk to Leah because Leah is the biggest brain on this in the in the country. Um, or the other is just, as I said, keep it going. Make sure you don't have to fund it anymore. You can if you want to for indexing and all that kind of stuff, but uh, basically draw the pension. And that works well from a financial planning perspective, makes your job easier because you can, you know, exactly indexed what they're going to get paid. So this is really go to the actuary, say we've got. Yeah, they do a retirement analysis for you, and they, yeah. they they're all good. So the firms that I continue to work with, so I'll name them: GBL, LMC, and West Coast, and Millet in Quebec, and there's other good ones. Bucks, okay. Um, they they'll prepare all that. They'll work with you and with your advisor to make sure that 
you're not jumping out with a, without, a, without a parachute. And if you're going to go the uh, back to the, and I just want to be clear here. So if you're going to do the transfer, you're going Lira, you're paying a bunch to the government, you're going to mm -hmm. have a tax hit on that. Yeah, but I find yeah, that's point. a pretty common decision for people to make. Do you think it's just born of? Uh, can, let's be, you know, unfortunately, avarice exists in the financial industry. And I think often that is the advisor looking at the compensation for taking over the pension and selling them a bunch of investment products. It's not always the case, but that's why I like a fiduciary standard. Um, I think, and also from a risk perspective, uh, you know, do, do, do they want to take on, I mean, they are with an IPP taking on investment risk, but I, too often I just look at it as a sell. Uh, and and uh, I mean, maybe I'm maybe I'm I, I, I'm biased, but uh, I, I prefer keeping them as a pension, running them as a pension and drawing it as a pension. And if, I mean, if that's what you're doing as the advisor, you're still like if you're still, on an still running the model, money, you're still. Yeah. yeah. So where you see it more on the advisory side is it's coming out of a group plan. Right. Like I see this, you know, all the time I've got this, you know, two million dollar pension and a million of it sur surplus and they're going to they're going to pay $500,000 in tax, but I'm going to pick up a million and a half of an account. Oh, great. So uh, I don't know. I mean, those are, you, those are questionable transfers anyways, the group plan to the individual pension plan. Well, you, you, they're just going to a Lira, right? Like the old, the plan oh, to I plan see. transfers okay. no longer. Yeah. So, cause that was, I mean, I, I did a big, uh, big article in the Globe and Mail two days before the budget two years ago when they brought it out saying no more. And then they reaffirmed it. And that's unfortunate. That's the, that's the government, that's finance doing surgery with a sledgehammer. And the reason that happened is because there's a few charlatans in the industry that were running around creating basically bogus corporations uh, and uh, putting an IPP in it and then rolling the plan over. Uh, and, and you know what? There are better remedies than wiping out that option because for for not a lot but for a few people it made sense they actually had real companies there was no reason that they couldn't continue to fund the plan the primary purpose test was fulfilled all that kind of stuff but once again i mean it's i it, you know we see it in insurance i call them the masters of financial alchemy uh where ethics take a holiday and and that's what that's the, what we've had happen here yeah, I uh, honestly, I thought the 2019 changes still allowed where it was like a legitimate operating company with a history of paying you salary. I thought you could still do the transfer, but am I misremembering I the dead. rules? I mean, or is it, we're waiting. Yeah. The, they reaffirmed in, the, in that budget they did, Friedland did this year, that they're going to go through with it. And my understanding is it is dead. Like they're, okay. some of the actuarial firms submitted it, but it's sitting in, in sort of a, uh, you know, stasis. With, sure. with the with CRA, yeah, I, I defer to you on this. I I 100% uh, doubt. I would call Leah, here. but uh, so, yeah. but, but uh, my understanding is that they've killed it. Yeah. Okay, that's fair. Um, now you talked earlier about your history here and how you know when you were at the actuarial firm, kind of your job was to go out and sell. But today, when you get, let's say you get 10 advisors who call you up and say, I've got a client who's thinking about, how many of those would you actually end up converting to IPP or how many of those would go a different route? Depends on their level of knowledge. If they understand it, if they have a planning, an objective planning approach, I'd probably say three out of 10 will go through, go through with it. If they're easily rebuffed, right? They don't understand it. They present an incomplete picture, particularly to the accountant. And I've heard the accountant's questions 5,000 times. They get it. They don't know what they're doing. Just for psychological reasons, it's going to fall apart. Uh, but there's, I mean, you see them going forward. I know like they, for instance, once the new rules came in, as we emerged from this COVID, uh, you know, coma, you're going to see more of them. Um, People are getting closer to retirement. Tax burdens are onerous. They're not getting any better. So that you are creating fertile ground, fertile ground for this stuff to go forward. Uh, but the the learning curve is steep because you're you know it's easier now with the provincial changes. But you you will get you know some advisors who do get it, and they work usually through osmosis. They pick it up. Some they want to be able to understand it in reading half a pamphlet, and this stuff isn't pamphlet material. So as I said, mass marketing, we've all tried it, but it's case by case by case. So if I'm the advisor 
and I run into a scenario where I, I think it might work. Client is 45, they've got a tax problem in the corporation, they have actual retirement goals. You know, I've sort of how, like, would I bring you in right away on that case, or do I sort of go to the accountant and say, you know, I'm thinking IPP, but I want to bring somebody in? Yeah, I would in. probably talk to the accountant first because you're going to get, you're going to see what your resistance looks like. Either they don't like them, they like them, or they don't know. It's more likely the, la the last uh, one, right? So, and then it's a conversation. I mean, they can talk to me or they can talk to any of the actuarial, like the firms I mentioned, they all have people in the field who will, you know, do this stuff and they will, you know, they, they, there's a fair bit of tire kicking that goes on, um, but they will answer the questions objectively. And I know for like the firms I mentioned, they'll turn down they tell, they'll tell you when it doesn't make sense. That's it's the ones where it makes sense all the time that you got to be suspect of. That's uh, yeah. I mean, that's the case with, with any good planning scenario, right? It's always an, it depends outcome. Yeah, exactly. So, but I mean, I, I do tend to, I mean, I, I, I get a fair number of calls on it and I mean, it's not my primary business and I don't bill for it. So I have to be careful of how much time I expend on it. Uh, so basically I point out to people, here's the whys and here's the why nots. And here's what your scenario looks like. If someone comes in and says, I have a 29 year old tech guy who wants to buy this hybrid plan because, uh, you know, they think it, you know, they can do this, this, and this, and they can put their, you know, four-year-old daughter in it or something. I'd be like, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I can see that. And I can see how that gets sold too. And it is sold. It's not consulting. Right, right. I mean, now, there's, there's, yes, there's nothing as you know, I still love the, 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 the peacemaking scene in the Godfather when they're all together and Barzini says, and Don Corleone will allow us access to his politicians and judges for which he will charge a reasonable fee. Cause after all, we are not communists, gentlemen, there's nothing wrong with driving a fee. We are all in sales, but if it's done in a consultative, in a truly fiduciary and an objective, a professional fashion, Hey, that's okay. That's that's how the, the economy is supposed to work. Fair enough. Yeah. The uh, the or sorry, the, we talked about the accountant a fair bit. With the IPP, is there any requirement to bring the corporate lawyer in, or is this strictly a tax? As a lawyer, I'll always tell you it's good to have more lawyers. Uh, <laughs> from a practical perspective, no. I mean, they just have to make sure that you know. I the number of cases where the lawyer was brought in. Few and far between. And again, I'm going to be jaded. Uh, they don't. They don't know what an IPP is. They've never seen the documents. You're generating a largely unnecessary legal bill. If your gut sense is you want counsel to review it, then go with your gut. Now you talked earlier about the initial funding, those sort of pools of initial funding. Can you talk about terminal funding a little bit? Sure. And and again, there's variations of this where you can modify and get bigger numbers by de-designating plans and things like that. But in essence, what happens is that when the client gets to retirement or 71, they can fund for terminal for so mortality, a survival survivor uh, benefits, and they can they can fund for indexing, and those numbers can be pretty large. And they are deductible. If you annuitize, it's embedded that funding's going in. Um, so, you know, a lot of the time we would put that on the table. Uh, if there was need for further deduction, uh, if perhaps there was an asset sale, and uh, and you wanted to generate some some further deduction, you would do that. And uh, so, most of the time, terminal funding is is done. And the terminal funding. I mean, if you have a seventy one year old who's married to a sixty one year old, for example. It's hundreds your, of thousands of dollars. Yeah, that's a that's a big survivor, especially if it's a male seventy one, female yep. sixty one. You're, yeah. And you know that's, you know it better than I do. So yes. <laughs> well, um, it's it's math, right? In the end, that's just math. So although yeah. math best left to the actuaries. So, well, actuary the actuaries. I always love the actuaries. It's the only profession where Asperger's is a uh, is a professional requirement. So. <laughs> You're going to get us all in trouble here. That's I'm always trouble. getting people in trouble is what I do. Thoroughly I, unelectable. <laughs> nice. um, now, anything else you think people should know about the IPP? Is there any ground we didn't cover here? No, I think, I mean, it's, it's something that should be considered. You're talking about any planner who's talking about retirement for clients who have active business corporations should at some point have a discussion about it. You know, you get an illustration done when they're 50 or 55. 
just to say, does this make sense? That way, you mean, it, it has in many cases, a lot of benefits. In certain cases, it doesn't fit, but those are going to be readily, readily apparent. And helping the accountants get their head around it, I think is critical because the vast majority of them have not, if there's only 15,000 plans, their level of functionality with it is going to be extremely minimal. I know some of the actuarial firms will do the presentation, like they'll say client or advisors, or if you bring us 10 accountants, we'll do the presentation to the accountants. Oh, they'll do, do it you... for less than that. It's I fair, mean, the yeah. guys I know, they'll go and see individual accountants because yeah. in fact, from a consulting perspective, I prefer doing one, meetings of one or two. You get better questions, you get far more repartee um, and they'll all do that. And I assume you'll do the same. You'll go sit with it. Oh, yeah, I talk to accountants all day. That's yeah. I'm a very exciting person. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, I. So it's kind of funny because we we're just talking about Kim Moody's podcast, and I uh, I showed my wife how excited I was to find this podcast. Well, Kim yesterday. Kim she, is always I lo I love Kim to bits, and I I love his uh, love his his jackets. Um, <laughs> I do the up opposite, so I wear the three piece Jacques Parizeau suit, and uh, <laughs> although not today because it's uh, it's summer, so. But uh, yes, we, we vie for snappy dresser and uh, yeah. uh, we we'll see where it goes. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen you in public, like out, outside of uh, Zoom. No, I haven't left the house. In, yeah. <laughs> the right. I, drive to, I drive to Starbucks. Uh, it's seven minutes from my house. That's my interaction with society. Right. So. One, one day we'll be able to leave the house again. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, anything you want to promote here? Give a, a shout out to... No, well, I mean, obviously, uh, we 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 want to talk about you know financial planning standards and things like that, uh, fiduciary standards, professionalism, thoroughness, objectivity, all those things. I mean, I'll entertain conversations on a wide variety of subjects. So yes, I talk about pensions and RCAs. I do a ton of insurance, uh, large case insurance, leveraged insurance, propeller head planning. Uh, the stuff is methodical, boring, lots of memos, lots of retain, you know, retained experts. So um, I, I, I enjoy talking to people about that kind of stuff. Not everything it results in revenue or a sale, and that's a good thing. Uh, caveat emptor, as we talked about some of the uh, offerings that are available in the pension, in the pension world, I just, uh, it has to make sense. You have to understand this is a meaningful solution for a real issue. And I think a lot of what I see, particularly in the hybrid space, is not that. I see an, a somewhat slick marketing to sell something. Uh, and it's, it's an investment product, by the way, because I know in one case, the so-called fiduciary standard uh, is not, it, though they claim to be observing it, they're being paid investment uh, fees. So I have an issue with that. But, you know... Um, Look, uh, I like talking to folks. Uh, I'm not George Costanza. Not everybody has to like me. So, um, but I'll give them a straight. I'll give them a straight answer. Now you've mentioned. I, I hate to drag this out, but um, you've mentioned the fiduciary standard four or five times in the course of this discussion. And people who've listened to me in the past will know that I've said, and I, I see some good arguments for this. I, I'm really, I think, coming around here. But you know, I, I've maintained that a fiduciary standard, while it would be useful, there's like a hundred other problems that I think we can solve in this business first. But clearly you have a... No, I don't disagree with you. I mean, I used to be on the side that, because I'm a personal responsibility guy, that you know, the client has some responsibility not to be an idiot. Um, but the, the case is, the simple fact is that what we're dealing with here, the confluence of investment, uh, tax, planning issues, and they're doing their, they're running their profession or business. It's a lot to ask of them. So, um, and I was just seeing some of what the, the jackals in our industry have perpetrated. Yeah, I'm in favor of a serious regulatory enema, particularly on the insurance side. Um, but a, a fiduciary standard, I think, in planning is is the is a necessary step. When it happens, I don't know, but it needs to. Um, what I have seen too often with with a lot of the advocacy groups is it's a race to the bottom. It's let's protect the lowest common denominator. Um, I'm tired of that. You know, planning, if it's truly a profession, should be you know attracting the exemplary candidates, the best, uh, because we do have. Uh, and I'm not a planner, right? I'm, I'm, I call myself a, a strategist. I don't carry the CFP. One day, maybe I'll do it. But um, it, it, we have, we have a duty, and uh, people, people 
just don't seem to get that all the time. You still see some wonderful people who do, and maybe they don't need the fiduciary standard because they're already living it. Uh, but I think that given the money that's involved in, in the sale of these products, given the scant disclosure that we see, given just sometimes the you know, rank incompetent, incompetence that's out there, um, I think the heavy hand of a fiduciary standard is a welcome, a welcome thing. It's, uh, I, you know, I appreciate that perspective. I, and I think that there is more to this maybe than I've given credit to. So yeah, I, I appreciate you uh, taking a minute. I mean, there's, there's, there's measures short of that that can happen. I mean, when I look at insurance licensing, I've said this for, you know, for a while, the CLU should be the requirement to have an insurance license, not you pass this, you know, rudimentary test, um, you know, and then they create all these designations all the time, which is just silly. You know what? So I took a I took a multiple choice online course over the weekend, and that establishes me as some kind of an expert. You know, silliness. No, make it hard. Yeah, I do agree that we have too many, way too many designations in this industry. I think that it's something that, uh, and, and I mean, I get the need for specialization, but I'm not convinced that these things are all representative of specialization. So. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. think we're on the same page. Yeah. All right. Um, any last minute thoughts or any um, concerns you want to share with us, Trevor? No, I think we're, we covered a lot. Yeah. We'll you Hopefully get together on another subject one of these days, but this has been great. I do plan to have you back to talk about the RCA as well. And, uh, and who knows what follows that. So thanks very okay. much for sharing. There we go. Your... You have a great summer. You too. Thanks so much. Cheers.